Hello everyone, welcome back to Serial Chronicles. Today we are here to assess a violent, murderous, ruthless savage, and to add to this, extremely charming. Ted Bundy is one of the most peculiar serial killers in the history of the United States. He was both a monster and a gentleman. I would say case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So we would think for such heinous crimes, the public would have a negative image of him. They did, but soon, he would also gain a lot of fans. A fan club grew out of all these screaming girls professing their love for him. He was a top story of his time. And no wonder a fan club grew out of this. But who could have imagined a man that committed all these heinous crimes have a bunch of young girls, which was mostly uh, his type of victims, professing their love for it. He was the top story of his time. The media had a field day, plus a documentary was done. Conversations with a killer, the Ted Bundy tapes. This reinvigorated interest in Ted like never before. So today, I'm going to tell you a story of this ruthless being named Theodore Robert Bundy. Before uh, going any further, I invite you to leave a like and subscribe to my channel. Without further ado, here goes the story of Mr. Theodore Bundy. Ted was born at Elizabeth Lund's home for unwanted mothers in Burlington, Vermont, to Eleanor Louise Cowell. While the identity of his father remains a mystery, Bundy's birth certificate lists Lloyd Marshall. Although Bundy's mother would later tell of being seduced by a war veteran named Jack Worthington. This was not the belief of the family. They believed that his mother's father, Samuel Caldwell, to be an abusive and a violent man. Ted was adopted by his grandparents, the Caldwell, and grew up believing that his mother was a sister. He only learned that his sister was really his mother when he was in high school. So as we can see, Bundy had a troublesome childhood and it was rumored that his grandfather was his biological father. So no wonder Bundy had became so screwed up in his later adulthood. In 1951, one year after their move, Louise Caldwell met Johnny Culpepper Bundy at an adult singles night held in the Tacoma First Methodist Church. In May of that year, the couple was married and soon after John Bundy adopted Ted, legally changing his name to Bundy. Ted and his stepfather interactions were not all that well. It is said Ted as a child was almost autistic. Since he lived disconnected from reality and was phobic towards people, both adult and children, he avoided anyone who was not his mother at all costs. This was somewhat expected since he grew up in a turbulent environment. To make matters worse, Ted entertained himself by butchering animals and torturing them. The usual signs of the later serial killer. Ted grew up not having a father figure or not wanting his surrogate father. Even though he was antisocial as a child, as an adult, he was not at all like that. In his later years, to understand himself better or for some additional reason, he chose the degree of psychology at the University of Washington and the University of Puget Sound. He graduated and worked but did not last long in any of the jobs that he had. For some reason, he soon gravitated to a law degree. At that time, he had become the Ted Bundy that the media later knew, handsome, intelligent, and charming. All of the women swooned for him, but he only chose to copulate with one. In 1967, Ted fell in love with his partner, Stephanie Brooks. Now, the girlfriend of Ted found herself in a situation that she was having different aspirations from her boyfriend, which is why she decided to cut off the relationship. Ted did not take this too well. He had grown an unhealthy obsession and pursued her for a long time trying to rebuild their relationship. This may have triggered something inside of him, something dark and gloomy. The crime side of him had finally awakened. Now he had officially joined the crazy side of things. He started to actively participate in politics in the ranks of Richard Nixon community representatives. After those political times, he was reunited with his first love, which did not end well, since they again ended a year later. 
It was found a week after the separation, Ted would murder his first victim with such violence and ferocity. Before beginning the murder, he perpetrated a series of robberies in houses and businesses. On January 4th, 1974, he entered the room of 18-year-old college student Joni Lentz, hit her in the head with a metal crowbar and raped her with the leg of the bed. The next day, the girl was found badly injured. She survived with permanent brain damage. Bundy was 27 years old at this point. On the night of January 31st, 1974, he attacked 21-year-old Washington University psychology student Linda Ann Haley. Bundy entered her room, knocked her unconscious, and dragged her out of the dorm. No one noticed a young woman was missing until the next day. The police did not establish any connection between the two attacks, and no further evidence or investigation of the crime scene was carried out. Linda Ann remains were discovered a year later in nearby mountain. Since that death, he basically never stopped until his arrest. It is said that most of Ted Bundy's murder were carried out in the state of Utah and Colorado, generally with the same modus operandi. He took women by car usually someone who were lost on the road or simply kidnapped them and took them to a forest or a secluded place to kill them and then bury them. They were all women. So Ted may clearly have some mommy issues. Shortly after that, the first body was found. Investigation began into a possible link given the time and proximity of the murders. In many cases, there were disappearances without any trace. Little by little, more witnesses began to appear in the case. They spoke of a handsome man who asked women for help, or a sensual young man who always went with books in his hands, or a very polite young gentleman with an arm in a cast. All the witnesses were right, it was Ted Bundy. Over the years, he became less meticulous, and more like a typical murderer, he was getting sloppy. He began to lose it and some of his victims got away. They talked to the police and described the person who kidnapped them. The one thing he still had going for him was a constant changing of his appearance and the city that he would be in. But his modi operandi was always the same. He used a cream colored Volkswagen car and other typical kidnapping tools, also the type of woman that he chose. So now he was acting like he wanted to be caught. On August 16, 1975, the police stopped him in his Volkswagen due to reports that was previously collected. He fled but was later arrested. They found all kinds of objects in his car. These were the objects that was used to kidnap and murder victims. There it was in the back seat, the iron bar he used to kill. This was his favorite weapon. Then on February 23, 1976, the first trial against him had begun. It was Carol Daronch who recognized him instantly because she was the last one Ted tried to kidnap, but had escaped. So at this point, he had been sentenced to 15 years in prison, but the trial continued unexpectedly because more evidence had been found in the car. There was evidence of Melissa Smith and Karna Campbell, so the trial was to go on, but Ted had a plan up his sleeve. Days later, Ted was guaranteed the ability to read books in the library. Who would have thought that the madman would jump out of a window to escape? Then on June 7, 1976, when the guards were distracted, he jumped out of the window into the woods. All at first glance, it seems like a really good plan. In reality, it was not so much, because days later he was captured again. In January 1977, he fled again this time through the roofs. Within hours, he entered the fraternity Chi Omega University uh, residence and killed. This is a blatant expression of how the man Ted Bundy loved to kill. He escaped prison and without any thought, he decided to start killing once more. He left two girls injured and killed two others. A young woman who managed to hide gave some clues about the man who was escaping from the youth hostel. Nearby, he wounded another woman who miraculously survived. On the way to Pensacola, Florida, Bundy was again arrested. It took seven hours of deliberation to sentence his last trial. 
That July 31, 1979, Judge Coart was clear and direct. Theodore Robert Cowell Bundy should die in the electric chair. Ted, using all his charm and his incredible intelligence in court and his knowledge of the law, did everything possible to get himself off his pending due, but this time it was to no avail. He murdered a total of 30 women and of course, that was only what he confessed to, but surely there were many more. According to him, he had also chosen the profession of serial killer because of pornography, but it made no sense at all since the horrors he committed did not justify that confession. He came to rape women, dismember them, decapitate them, and then commit necrophilia. On January 17, 1989, he obtained a final date. He was to be executed a week later. Bundy hadn't given up his fight to avoid death and tried to keep his confessions as bait to buy more time. He and his lawyers asked for a three-year extension for him to confess to other murders. He also tried to coerce the relatives of his victims into petitioning the court for more time to confess. Although the whereabouts of many of the victims were unknown, all the families refused. He was finally executed on January 24, 1989. His execution was attended by many people to celebrate that horrific event, the death of one of the world's most ruthless, prolific killers. Totally changed the paradigm of how serial killers were seen because he was very outgoing and used his physique and his funny way of speaking to empathize with an audience and a society that wandered for a moment to try and forgive a vicious man like Ted Bundy. If you liked the video, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much and see you next time.